All righty then. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Now, 99% of Christians and churches that you go to will never give you this teaching. But it's the most important, if not one of the most important teachings ever. If you wonder why there's so many lies around our world and in churches, and sometimes you have to ask yourself, I wonder if I'm caught believing in a wrong doctrine taught by Christian churches. So I want you to check yourself. Have you been caught and have you been deceived? And this video will be incredibly eye-opening. It will make you understand the Bible more than you ever did before. A lot of people, they'll give so many different interpretations from the Bible that you don't know which one is which. But if you know this teaching, if you watch this video and look at it all the way, write down the verses and you study and pray yourself. Yeah. You don't believe a word that I'm saying, yeah. but you study and look for it yourself. It will be incredibly eye-opening. And I bet you it's a word you never heard before. And you never heard it in your churches and people have hardly talked about it. Have you ever heard of a word called dispensationalism? Yeah, now, dispensationalism, what is that? Dispensationalism, basically, the dummy version of it is we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people to the right time period. Because if you don't do that and apply all the verses to yourself, you're going to come up with major wrong doctrine. You might say, really? Yes, some verses do not apply to you. There are verses that will apply to a different group of people or to a different time period. Amen. For example, uh, in the Bible it talks about that if you take God's name in vain, then you are supposed to be stoned to death. Yeah. Well, obviously, then all of us would be dead today. Yeah. So that obviously don't applies to us today. The Bible also says that if you have fabric that's mixed with each other, then that's an abomination to God. Well, obviously, that doesn't apply to us today. The Bible also says that uh, your hair, that it shouldn't, uh, there shouldn't be a razor on the head and that you're not supposed to drink grape juice. Now, uh, that don't apply to us today. That applies to Nazarenes, mm -hmm. people of the Nazarene group. That was a command given to them during the Old Testament. So you have to look at these verses. If you don't believe in dispensationalism, then uh, come on, this is common sense. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nation? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend uh, up to heaven, above the heights of the cloud, above the stars. Yet thou shalt be cast down to hell. Now is that talking about you or Lucifer? Well, duh, it's Lucifer. So that verse does not apply to you. It applies to Lucifer. So that's why even churches will admit this. There is a thing called an Old Testament divided from the New Testament. So that is a matter of fact. You have to rightly divide things. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible says that the word of God has to be rightly divided. So we're going to be talking about rightly dividing, rightly dividing, because there's so much wrong division. There's so much division in the churches. And so the churches think the way to get along with each other is to tolerate Tolerate wrong things? No. There should be division, but right division. You wonder why the church is so divided? Because there's wrong division, meaning there's wrong teachings, wrong doctrines. You can't pretend that all doctrines, that even though they contradict with each other, that uh, overall we can get along. No, that's called the ecumenical movement. That's called the new world order. Yeah. We live in a spirit and a world of toleration. Yeah. Why do you think God hated the Tower of Babel where everyone united? Yeah. God don't like that. There has to be a division. 
There has to be a division. But there has to be a right division, not a wrong division. You get so many channels online of people, say, professing themselves to teach the truth and they're the right one, and then they become a cult themselves and they can't pastor their own church. Why? Because they're losers. Because all they are is a cultic mindset, I'm right, everybody's wrong. Now, what you're going to find out from this video is, well, what if... Brother Kim, you're the same way, that you think you're right and everybody's wrong. Well, one, no, I'm not. If you go to our website, I'm in line with a bunch of Bible-believing churches and pastors. But number two, the reason why you think that the way I'm teaching, I'm right and everybody's wrong, is you never heard this kind of teaching before. You've been so deceived by the 99% of wrong stuff in churches and even online, you, you never heard this kind of teaching before. And I bet you you'll never hear about it. And I'm going to show you. Perhaps you've heard of dispensationalism, but there are wrong dispensationalists too. There's a group called revised dispensationalism, which means they're, they're too weak in dispensationalism. And there's a group called mid-axe dispensationalism, which means they're more hyper in dispensationalism. So you need right dispensationalism, rightly dividing. See, the devil can divide as well, but do you have rightly dividing? This video will probably be unlike any other, and I'm not saying it to boast. It's because it's that sad that there's not... So many of these kind of videos out there. Yeah, that's true. All right. And if you don't think so, then I challenge you to go out and find stuff and then to post it. And you're going to find out that they're not going to teach what you're going to hear tonight. OK, so I'm going to show you about rightly dividing verses. This will be incredibly eye opening and clear up all the confusion. All right. Go to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18. Ray Comfort from Living Waters Ministry uses this verse to tell people that they have to turn away from their sin. If they still mess around with sin, then you're going to hell. Now, that's why he emphasizes repentance so strongly on that one. And there are people who doubt their salvation and wonder, well, I'm still messing around with this sin and that sin. I'm trying to get victory over it, but I still mess up. And let's be honest. When I got saved, I didn't realize that there's a checklist of all these sins that I have to clean up. I mean, uh, then salvation makes it difficult. Then salvation makes it difficult. If, even if you think you're a good guy, trust me, if God were to check your heart and your thought, he's going to point out other sins that you never thought about before. Oh, so because you didn't repent of those sins, then I guess you weren't really saved then? All right, so go to Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel 18, you'll notice at verse 21, But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. You'll notice at verse 24, But when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity. Oh, so if you're a righteous person, righteous Christian, but you backslide into sin, and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Wow. See, you will die in your sin. Well, then uh, what's the answer to this? The answer to this is notice in right here, number one, who is the verse speaking to? Number two, what time period? Remember, that's the definition of dispensationalism that I gave earlier. Now, look at this. Ezekiel 18 is in what time period? Is this New Testament? No, you're reading from the Old Testament. Who is he speaking to? Jews. Ezekiel was speaking to Jews. Obviously, he was not in a church building that time, and Christianity did not exist yet because Jesus did not die on the cross yet. All right, look at Exodus 4. Exodus 4. So then why are you applying that verse to yourself? Amen. So if there is a group out there that's using Old Testament verses to make you doubt your Christianity, then they're in the wrong group. Look at Exodus 4. Exodus chapter 4. There's a group now where they talk about the signs and wonders movement. And then they say that it, that's why you go to these uh, meetings and then you put in the money in the plate 
and prosperity gospel preachers, they've been ripping money off of you and then doing those sham stuff with healings and speaking in tongues. And let's be honest, when you first did a, attended a service like that, that kind of spooked you out and yeah. you thought that was weird. So then, this speaking of tongue, these signs and all these wonders, is that for the Christian church? Well, look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4. And then uh, look at verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Okay, what does God say? And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. Okay, now look at verse 9. This is the first sign mentioned in the Bible. You know that? First time sign is mentioned. And who is he speaking to? And what time period? Verse 9, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river. Wow, so it, it is signs. And who are they for? They are for the Jews. Look at verse 5 that they may believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and no, that, the, that they may believe the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Jews, look at that. All right, go to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Good teaching. Look at Exodus chapter 20. You get these people saying that Christians should keep the Sabbath. And then Christian church will say, no, we don't do keep the Sabbath anymore because we're under New Testament. But then they will claim, no, the Bible says that remember, meaning that you shouldn't forget it. Okay, look at Exodus chapter 20. What time period is this? And who's the group of people he's speaking? Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Okay, sure, don't forget it. Keep in remembrance. But who is he speaking to? Look at verse 2. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Why, that's speaking to those Jews who are under slavery in Egypt. Were, you, were any of you in Egypt in chains? Come on, man. Come on, man. So you got to realize this, that this is the Ten Commandments that's given to the Jews, the forefathers. You'll notice right here that at verse 18 and 19, the people, that's the Jews, saw it. And verse 19, they said unto Moses, right? So these are all Jewish people. Okay, you'll notice that at verse 22, And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the church. Is that what it says? Unto the Christians. No, unto the children of Israel. So these are Jews. Okay, now let's go to Mark 16. Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. This passage has been used and abused so often that people think that they have to do water baptism for salvation or that the signs and wonders movement apply to them. No, you got to look at this. Mark chapter 16. In verse 16, the Bible says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Ooh, that's a problem. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then, see people think that you have to be water baptized for salvation or the signs and wonders movement are necessary. Well, if that's the case, then I would like to see them going around during COVID. Where were they? Where were they? Where were they? Especially look at Kenneth Copeland and some of these preachers who said that COVID go away. And they gave a prophecy about by this time it will go away. It didn't go away. What are you talking about? See, so you got to realize that that's very dangerous, so you got to stay away from that stuff. Amen. Well, what's the answer to that? Look at the group of people he's talking to and the time period. You'll notice right here we, we're in the Old Testament, but now there's a dotted line here. And this dotted line, we're under the Acts of the Apostles. 
Did you ever notice that these people's favorite passages about water baptism for salvation, speaking in tongues and receiving the Holy Ghost, which is signs, and then the healing signs, the visions and all that, that's all in the book of Acts and that's their favorite? It's called Acts of who? Of the apostles. So you have to see what group of people it is. Look at Mark 16. Who is he speaking to? Look at verse 14. Verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the who? Eleven. The eleven. That's the eleven apostles. Notice they had trouble believing at verse 14. Notice they had trouble believing in verse 13. And that's why God said at verse 16, they have to believe. And that's why verse 17 and 18, the signs, and then the baptism at verse 16, God says believing is important. See, it was to the apostles. That's why the book of Acts is called Acts of the Apostles. Why? It's their acts that they did those healing signs and those wonders. Look at uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. How many of you have heard that you have to get water baptized for salvation to receive the forgiveness of sins? In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why, who is he speaking to? Verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. See, it's Jews. Amen. So those acts of the apostles, why? They're dealing with Jews. Think about it. When Acts started, they didn't start with the Christian church Gentile. They started with Jews. Yeah. Remember that? Sure, they started a church, but church is simple. It means called out assembly. And number two, the church consisted of Jews, not Gentiles. Amen. So who is he speaking to? What time period? It's the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, let's look at James 2. James 2. James 2. James chapter 2. Now, uh, who's the author here? James. Is he an apostle? He's an apostle of Jesus Christ, right? So then James 2 follows in line with the acts of the apostles. Is he speaking to Jews? Let's look at James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And then we'll look at verse James chapter 2. And then verse 17. How many of you have heard of this verse? Faith and works necessary for salvation. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Uh, look at uh, verse 24. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Wow, so it seems to show that uh, if you are saved by faith, then you need works to accompany it. But look who he's speaking to. James chapter 1 and verse 1. He's an apostle. So this is the acts of the apostles. And notice who he's speaking to. James 1.1. 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the who? Twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. See, it's the twelve tribes of Israel. Now go to Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. How many of you have heard of uh, Hebrews 6? Excuse me. Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6. Now, how many of you have heard of this verse that you cannot repent again? And that's why you have to keep going on. If you fall back, if you fall away, then you lose your salvation. Look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse uh, one, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, verse 6, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Wow, that's problematic. But the answer is simple. Who is he speaking to? Look at the title. What's the title of the book? Hebrews. Hebrews. And what's the time period? Look at verse 5. Verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the what? World to come. It's the future time period, like the tribulation. See, notice it's a future time period application. It's the future tribulation. It's not talking about now in the Christian church. So it's a future time period, the tribulation. So right over here is the future. After the Christian church age, we have another time period here. It's the future time period. Okay, now let's look at another passage, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Look at Matthew 24. Now, how many of you have heard people talking about that, you know, we will have to go through the tribulation or that there's going to be a rapture after we go through the tribulation. That's a teaching that's made famous. And their favorite passage is Matthew chapter 24. Look at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation, then what happens? The rapture at verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Wow, that's a problem. But look who he's speaking to. Look at verse 16. 16. Then let them which be in where? Judea. Judea flee into the mountains. Recall verse 19. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Look at verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the wind. Sabbath day. They're Jews. This is what time period? Verse 21, for then shall be great what? Tribulation. tribulation. That's a tribulation time period, future. These are for Jews in the tribulation, not Christians in the church age. Jews in the tribulation. So think about it. That's why there's so many Old Testament prophecies that God promised to the Jews that he will come as a Messiah and set up a kingdom on earth. But that never happened. That's sometime in the future. And the Jews, what are they looking for right now? Their Messiah to come down as king and to reign on the earth and to reestablish Jerusalem. Why? Because the Jews are Old Testament Jews. They're not New Testament Christians. So they don't know the New Testament scriptures. But notice right here, these are for Jews in the tribulation. How many of you heard of this verse at Matthew 24? Look at Matthew 24 and verse 13. 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. How many of you have heard Christians talking about you got to endure to the end so you can be saved? That's not us. That's Jews in the tribulation. Now, why do we believe Christians are not going through the tribulation, but rather their rapture is different? Our rapture is in the church age right here. We're going up. The Jews in the tribulation, their rapture is this time period in the tribulation going up. How do we know that? Well, look at right here. If you look at this chart, notice Matthew to John, Hebrews to Revelation, in this time period, when they were writing those books, it was during the Acts of the Apostles. Now, in Matthew 24, when Matthew is the writer of the book, he's the apostle. Notice he mentioned about the tribulation. 
How about that? Um, Ray Comfort says his favorite book is the book of 1 John. And that's why he makes people doubt their salvation because they haven't done all these good works. But John is what? He is the acts of the apostles. They're addressing Jews. Have you ever read uh, John's epistles? He mentioned it is the last time. He mentioned the Antichrist will come. Tribulation. Have they read uh, 1st, 2nd Peter? They mentioned that scoffers will rise up in the last times, the last days, in the latter times. Uh, have they read about um, James where it says that you have heaped treasure together for the last days? Have they read Hebrew? The world to come whereof we speak at Hebrews 2. Hebrews 1, the last days. Hebrews 6, the world to come. We looked at, uh, so all of this is tribulation reference time period. A lot of this is Jewish reference. We see so much of that. Are the apostles Jews? Look at this. Their, their ministry is different from Paul. Look at Galatians. Look at Galatians. There are two places. I want you to go to Galatians 2, Galatians 2, and 1 Corinthians 15. Galatians 2 and 1 Corinthians 15. Now look at this. Look at the difference here. 1 Corinthians 15 and Galatians 2. Let's, so to cut it down is this. To cut it down right here is that Paul is the apostle for the Gentiles. Now, remember, if you know your Bible, God was turning from the Jews to the Gentiles because the Jews rejected God. So then God, he had to turn from Jews to Gentiles. When he was turning to a different group of people, look at who, at a time period, different time period, what happened? Paul came in, who's an apostle to the Gentiles. His books are Romans to Philemon, and those are addressed to Gentiles. Not Hebrews, because Hebrews is addressed to Hebrews, Jews. It mentioned tribulation, like I pointed out, right? So then Romans to Philemon, they're addressed to Gentiles. How do you know that? Look at the beginning verses and you'll find it out in Romans to Philemon. It's addressed to Gentiles in Christian churches. And notice that Paul's ministry is different from the apostles' ministry. Galatians 2 and verse 9, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, see the apostles there, perceive the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the who? Heathen. So Paul goes to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And they, oh, yeah, the on. apostles unto the who? Circumcision. Circumcision. Look at that. Amen. So notice right here that their ministry is to the Jews. But it's more, uh, more plain when you look at verse 8. Verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the who? Circumcision. Circumcision. Peter is an apostle. And the apostles are to Jews. The same was mighty in me, Paul, toward who? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. Their ministries are different here. So then, what does Paul say at 1 Corinthians 15? Come on, Come on brother. Paul mentions that there are different raptures here. And he says there's a rapture for the end, the tribulation, which distinguishes from the rapture of those who belong to Jesus Christ. Aren't you Christians? You belong to Christ. That's why we're called Christians. We're the body of Christ. Paul says our rapture is distinguished and different. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 15, the famous passage on the rapture, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Why, in that rapture, what does Paul say? You'll notice at verse 21, 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the what? 
Resurrection of the dead. Okay, this is the dead rising up, right? Here's the rapture being discussed. Look at verse 23. But every man in what? His own order. There's an order system. Christ, the first fruits. Jesus Christ raised himself from the dead, right? And he raptured up to heaven. We know that, right? One, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Isn't that you and I? Yes, we belong to Christ, the body of Christ, Christians. We have our own rapture as well. Then, verse 24, cometh the end. See that the tribulation has their own rapture. So that's why I notice that we, we have our rapture that's distinguished from the tribulation rapture. But if that's not enough, notice 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And then I want you to also turn to uh, Luke. Turn to the book of Luke 21. Luke 21 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Luke 21 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, notice that Paul, he talks about the rapture at 1 Thessalonians. We know that. He's talking about the rapture because it's very plain when you look at verse 16 and 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. There's our rapture. But what did Paul say about our rapture? He said at verse 9, chapter 5, chapter 5 and verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to what? Wrath. So our appointment, our time period is not wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, our rapture. So our rapture is not wrath, okay? Now look at Luke 21, Luke 21. People who teach that Christians will go through the tribulation, they come up with this fancy, complicated teaching that, well, we will still go through the tribulation, but uh, we're just not going through the wrath. So the final day of the tribulation is wrath, and that's when before the wrath comes down, we get raptured. But we're still going through the tribulation. Now notice how confusing that sounds. We make it easier by saying, Look, the wrath is the future tribulation. And God says our time, our appointment to be rapture is not during wrath. All right, look at Luke 21. Luke 21 right here. Luke 21. Now, remember Matthew 24, the language. Luke 21 is the same passage as Matthew 24 that we read about going through the tribulation, enduring to the end, and getting raptured. Look at Luke 21, the wording right here. The Bible says, verse 21, Then let them which are in where? Judea. Judea flee to the mountains. Why, isn't that Matthew 24? That's the same thing. Verse 22, For these be the days of what? Vengeance. It's wrath. Verse 23, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Doesn't that match with Matthew 24 that we read? Okay, keep reading. For there shall be great distress in the land, and what? Wrath. wrath upon this people. See, tribulation is wrath, but our appointment is not to wrath, okay? We go up here. That's very plain. So no, notice that with Paul's writing, the church is very different from a Jew. Whenever they give you a wrong doctrine, it's going to be very highly likely to a Jew. Yeah. Remember that. Remember that. Here's another one. Go to Romans 11. Romans chapter 11. Amen. What about where you have to uh, turn away from all your sins? And what about the idea that, well, we are saved by faith. And you're going to hear John MacArthur. You're going to hear Paul Washer. And you're going to hear John Piper. And you're going to hear Vody Botcham. And you're going to hear all these guys 
talking about a salvation by faith alone, sola fide they'll call it, and they boast about that, but they're no, they're no sola fide, and I'm more sola fide than they are. Fide on that one, okay? They just eat filet -o fish or something like that. So if you look at Romans 11 verse 6, you'll notice that I'm more sola fide than they are. If I believe salvation by grace alone, I don't believe that you have to do good works after that. Works have to be separated from grace. But these same people will say, no, James 2, James 2. When you have a faith, it should have works alongside it. No, we saw it's a different group of people, different time period. But let's look at Romans. Remember, that's our time period, right? Paul writing to the Romans, okay, to Philemon. That's to us. Look what he said in Romans 11, 6. Let's see if grace has works in it, okay? And if by grace, then is it much of works to prove a real grace, a real faith? No, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is what? No more grace. You invalidate grace. But if it be of works, if you want to put works in there, then what? Is it no more grace? Then you get rid of grace. If you want to put work with grace, then you know what you're doing? You're getting rid of the definition of good works too. It says, otherwise, work is no more work. Work is work. Grace is grace. Let's keep the two separated and leave it that way. Why are you mingling the two? And they complicate it by saying, if you have a, uh, well, I know the Bible says salvation by grace alone, not by works, but in this passage, you're supposed to have works. So if you have real, genuine grace, then it's supposed to have works. See, this is confusing, complicated. Let's make it simple. That's for Jews, all right? James 2, the works. And the time period is tribulation. Us, Gentiles, right? So then what happens? The Bible says that our salvation is grace, not by works. All right, let's look at another example. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1. Now, some people might say, well, what if I'm a Jew and I want to get saved today? Very simple. God, God is he, what did he do with the Jews? He turned from Jews to Gentiles. So if you're a Jew today, you got to go along with the Gentiles in their program, just like when God was dealing with Jews at the Old Testament, yeah. Gentiles had to go along with the Jews' program. Amen. It's that simple. Yeah. Yeah. All right? Some people might say, well, Paul said the last trump at 1 Corinthians 15, so isn't that the final trump of the seven trumpets at the tribulation? Look how complicated that is. Let's make it simple. Because we're getting out of here, to us, that's the last trump. It's that simple. All right. Now, look, you just have to read it as it says. Yeah. Look at the time period and the group of people. You notice how cultists make it very complicated. Yeah. Talk about stuff that you didn't hear about before. And you're like, where is this all coming from? Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 1. Let's see if Paul thought water baptism is the same thing as the gospel for your salvation. It's not. The gospel salvation is separated from water baptism. Amen. Paul said at verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to what? Preach the gospel. Whoa! Water baptism is not the salvation gospel. Why? It's Paul's, look at the books right here, it's Corinthians. Romans to Philemon. Romans to Philemon. Look at that. Okay, look at that. All right, let's... Uh, so we see over here that these passages show that uh, we are saved. What about losing salvation? No, we don't believe in losing salvation. How can you lose your salvation? Once saved, always saved. Look at Ephesians 1. Yeah. Ephesians 1. Well, the Bible says that, the Bible says that uh, once you taste the Holy Spirit that you can lose it. What verse are you quoting? Yeah. Hebrews, Hebrews 6, right? Yeah. Look at these books. Are they quoting Matthew through John? Are they quoting from Hebrews to Revelation when these are written by the apostles whose ministries are to Jews? Are they quoting you Old Testament verses that are for Jews? If they're quoting that and they're applying it to the church, you know they're wrong. 
Paul, what did he say to the church? Look what Paul said to the church at Ephesians 1, 13. <coughs> In whom he also trusted, after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were what? Sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed. Sealed how long? You're sealed all the way to glory. Look at verse 14 which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Until you go home to glory, you're sealed all the way. Yeah. Even when I sin? Yes, even when you yeah. sin. Look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, See, you're grieving the Holy Spirit with your sin, right? Yeah. Whereby ye are what? Sealed. sealed unto the day of redemption. Oh, See, you're sealed no matter how many sins you committed. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore. How about that? Imagine you just quote Ezekiel 18. You'll kill the Holy Spirit after that during that singing. Well, if the righteous man turn from his iniquity, see, who taught you that? A man named Living Waters with almost a million subscribers or more? And that attracted your attention? Subscriber amount is what you believe to be the truth rather than the Word of God. Amen. But the Bible says repent, repent all over. Yeah, uh, what verse is he reading? Yeah. What time period? Yeah, we believe in repentance, yeah. but you know what? The Bible says that repent means a change of mind. Yeah. And we believe in repentance, but Paul pointed out right here that even if you're still sinning, yeah. well, guess what? You're still sealed to the day of redemption. Thank God. When I got saved by faith, I had a change of mind, a repentance, where what did I do with my sin? I didn't quit all my sins, clean up all my sins. I turned to Jesus Christ, put my trust in Him, let Him clean up the sin and the mess in my life. I don't do it myself. I don't turn from my own sin. Jesus Christ turns the sin all around for me. It's that simple. That's my repentance. That's why the Bible talks about repentance if... It's referring to the New Testament Christians for their salvation. Okay, now, here's another one. I want you to think about all these verses that Paul has quoted to the Christian church. Romans to Philemon, Romans to Philemon. Those are your verses. If they pull up any other verse in the Bible, then you will be deceived. Don't fall for that. Okay, there's another one that I want to point out is there's a group out there that will teach you wrong division that they'll go hyper mode, I told you. So we address the weak mode of people rightly dividing. Now we got to address the hyper mode. The hyper mode is, well, because it's Romans to Philemon, we should chop off all the other books in the Bible and we only read Romans to Philemon. Then your Bible is this small. You know that? That's ridiculous. No, we, have, we read the whole Bible. It's for our reading. Amen. But then those hypers will say, but our doctrine is Romans to Philemon, Romans to Philemon. So because of that, that's why all these other books are not necessary. No, look at the Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Good, Come on. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The Bible says all Scripture... Yeah is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. And that's the Apostle Paul in Romans to Philemon, that book, where he said that. So beware of people who put a mid-acts term. If they say mid-acts, mid-acts, then beware of that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Notice right here that all the scripture we can claim 
And the Bible says it can be used for doctrine or reproof, correction, or instruction in righteousness. Here's another one. Uh, I want you to go to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Now, this is the only verse that you're going to ever find in your Bible, okay? And if you want to be a hyper and, don't, and you don't want to apply that to yourself, then, uh, wow, you're, I think that you, you commit a really grievous sin. Look at Leviticus 19, and I want you to look at verse 29. 29. This is the only verse in your Bible that tells you not to prostitute your daughter. Leviticus 19, 29. Do not prostitute thy daughter. To cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. If I were to quote that to somebody who was committing that sin, and it's sad, it's really bad. There are parents now who are prostituting their daughters, you know that? It's really wicked and sad. And if I quoted that verse, what if that person said, well, no, that verse don't apply to me. See, that's a wicked doctrine. So beware of people who say, we're dispensationalists, we're dispensationalists. But then what they mean is hyper-dispensationalists. They're hyper. So then watch, look for the term mid-acts. When you hear that term mid-acts, then you know, stay away. They're snakes. They're snakes. Their hero is the Apostle Paul because that's where we get our Christian doctrine from, right? But then they idolize Paul like more than Jesus Christ pretty much. So when Jesus Christ teaches something, they invalidate his teachings and they go more by Paul's teachings. Now, when you go that far, I think there's something wrong with your head, buddy. So that's a wrong spirit. So then let's look at what their hero, Apostle Paul, said at Romans 16. Romans 16. Look at their hero, Apostle Paul, Romans 16. Romans chapter 16. Now I'm going to address weak dispensationalism here as well as hyper dispensationalism. So then people will call you heretics if you don't believe in dispensational salvation. You heard that term? Dispensational salvation. We believe that the salvation that you've heard in these other verses is different from Christian New Testament church age salvation. So that's what we teach. So we call it dispensational salvations. Trust me, when you mention that term in your church and they don't believe in that, you're going to find out real quick that this video's title is true. That, wow, it's 99% of churches, if not 100% that I, in my area. Yeah. All right? So we believe that the Christian salvation is very different from all these other salvation taught in these other verses. But these weak dispensationalists or anti-dispensationalists who are also known as revised dispensationalists, they're going to claim and they're going to say that, uh, well, uh, no, you know, we, we all shared the same salvation plan. No, what you're going to find out is that Paul said that it was a mystery yeah. and it wasn't revealed until him. Bam. Look at Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the what? Mystery, Mystery which was what? <laughs> kept secret since the world began. See, it's not disclosed. Come on. It's kept secret until Paul. But now, see that? Is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. See that right there? It was revealed to Paul. Some people will be so amateur and they'll say, see, obedience of faith, so you have to obey. You know what that means? Okay, what is salvation by faith? You trust and believe in Christ for salvation. Did you obey that? Yeah, yeah it's so simple, okay? Why do, you, why do you have to make it complicated, you know? You have to obey and follow the commandments. It never said that. It's talking about faith here, okay? Ah, uh, they like to complicate the gospel. Come on. Now, we notice right here that, so it's proof that Christian salvation wasn't revealed until now. It was kept secret from before. But then hyper-dispensationalists, they'll say, well, so, see, it's only Paul, so we have to go, so only these books. No, Paul said the scriptures, which he's talking about the Old Testament, were pointing out the salvation that he was preaching about. Yeah. He realized it was kept secret, 
But it was in the scriptures, nevertheless, he admitted. Look at uh, Romans 16, verse 26. But now is made manifest and by the what? Scriptures of the prophets. What do you think that was? Yeah, Old Testament. Yeah, that's you right. hyper dispensationalists, you. Yeah. You didn't realize that before. So then, what's the answer right here? The answer is this. How are you going to deny Old Testament verses that your beloved apostle Paul quoted if you're a hyper dispensationalist? Yeah, if you don't think those Old Testament verses are important for us to use, your beloved Apostle Paul thought so. Yeah. He, he probably quoted more Old Testament than you guys who are hypers. Wow, how about that? So then, see, we don't believe in that hyper-dispensationalism heresy. Okay, so then, here's the question then. The question is, then what's going on right here? The answer is based on two things right here. The answer is two things right here. One, God, He is I am that I am, right? He is Alpha and Omega. Now, there's no doubt when you study prophecy and divine decrees in even other religions, but they will admit this. When there's like a prophecy or a divine decree, what? The decree or the statement or the word from God, it can go wherever. He can be jumping from one person to a different person, yeah. jumping from one time period to a different, uh, different time period, all in one statement. Didn't you know that? That's our God. Why? Because He is I am that I am. You might say, I don't believe in that. That's too weird. No, you better believe in that. Otherwise, you're weird. Look at Isaiah. I mean, not Isaiah. Look at uh, Luke. Luke 4. Luke 4. Jesus believed in that. If you don't believe in it, Jesus believed in it. Look at the book of Luke, chapter 4. And I want you to go to Isaiah 61. Isaiah, chapter 61. I want you to go to Luke 4 and Isaiah 61. Notice that Jesus believed that even in one verse, one verse in the Bible, it can jump time periods. And that he has to rightly divide even one verse where half of it applies to his first coming and the second half to his second coming. Wow. What are you talking about? Look at Luke 4. Look at the book of Luke chapter 4 and verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit writes down, and he closed the book. Yeah, right. And he gave it, uh, verse 21, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What is he quoting? Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Jesus is quoting this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable ear of the Lord. And Luke said, and he closed the book and said, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Why? Because the second half of verse 2 is not fulfilled. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that, are, that mourn. Why? Jesus did not come to take vengeance. He didn't take vengeance yet. That's in the future tribulation when he sets up his kingdom for the Jews. That's what those Old Testament Jews were looking at. Right. See? But they weren't rightly dividing, so they didn't know that. So notice that Jesus divided even one verse, half of it. Woo! So then these hyper-dispensationalists, they're going to say, well, Christians shouldn't claim any verse from Matthew through John, Hebrews to Revelation, because that's for Jews in the tribulation. No, there are plenty of verses that we can use to apply for ourselves. Yeah. John 3, 3, uh, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's a great verse for us that we can use for ourselves. 1 John 5, 
13, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Amen. That's a great verse that we can apply to ourselves. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, it talks about unto him that washed us in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests. That's a great verse. What do you do with these verses? You have to divide which ones can apply to us and which one can apply to other people. Why do I have to do that? That's so much work. Don't forget the first verse. Study to show thyself. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Don't you dare be ashamed of that. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't be ashamed of dividing those verses. Because why? You have to. That's how your God is. Jesus did that. Here's the problem. Look at Hebrews 1. This is a big problem if you don't divide it. Look at Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And I want you to go to 1 Kings. Open your Bibles to 1 Kings. Uh, 2 Samuel, excuse me. Go to your, open up your Bibles to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. Look at the book of 2 Samuel. And then we'll look at chapter 7. Chapter 7. Now uh, look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1, okay? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will, look at this, again, so Hebrews is quoting another verse here. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Okay, what verse is Hebrews quoting from? Look at in Samuel 7. So this is Jesus Christ, amen, uh, Hebrews 1? That's Jesus Christ. All right, look at 2, King, 2 Samuel, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 14. Verse 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. That's the passage Hebrews is quoting. But you better divide that. Why? Because this ain't Jesus when you read the second half of verse 14. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. That ain't Jesus. Jesus don't sin unless you want to blaspheme and say that. So notice right here, you have to divide even one verse and split it in half, one to one time period, one to another time period. You might say, why would God do that? Why would God do that? Simple. Because when he's speaking, a lot of times when he's quoting like a whole passage, God is omnipresent everywhere. Time, he's not bound by time. He's Alpha and Omega. So when he's speaking about your present time, he'll be speaking about a past time as well. Why? He's not going to be bound and dictated by your time period and stoop low to your level. I'm going to address it to your time period and to you. No, God's like, no, I'm going to address whoever I want to in what time period because I am that I am in every time period and all sorts of people. See, so because he's seeing everybody, all sorts of groups of people, and all sorts of time period, he gives just one statement for all of that. Because he, he is. I am that I am. He's everywhere. He can't help it. That's his nature. Yeah. That's the way he talks. Okay? Yeah. Unless you want to get rid of our immutable, omniscient, omnipresent God. Yeah. Our God is timeless. He's not bound by time. But see, you're bound by time. You're bound by time. That's why you, God commanded you. You've got to rightly divide what time period, what group of people that you're in. That's why the Bible's written that way. You might say, why is the Bible written that way? Because one, it's God's words, not man's word. Amen. And when God speaks, he's not bound by time or groups of people. So he has to talk like that. But when you, mankind, they are bound by time. If you went by God's time, you and I will be bl obliterated from existence. Unless you, uh, unless you are, I am that I am, which you're not. All right? God can do whatever he wants, Old Testament, and jump through here because he's present tense in all here. You're not, friend. Amen. Don't even try to be God. Yeah. Okay? Now, that's explanation one. Explanation two, why is it written that way? You got to understand, 
Dispensationalism is historical grammatical interpretation. Yeah. Grammatical meaning we read the word as it says. Yes. You notice that? Yeah. I didn't quote Greek and Hebrew. I didn't jump to 200 different modern plus Bible versions Amen. to give the real meaning. I stick to one book and I read it as it says. Amen. You read it as it says, okay? Grammatical. Second thing, historical. So why is that? Notice the historical timeline. Yeah. This is the acts of who? Apostles. Apostles. Apostles, who are they ministering to? Gentiles at the beginning or Jews? Jews. Jews. Was their primary, primary ministry Jews or Gentiles? Jews. Jews. But then Paul came later on. Yeah. Paul came later on and he was ministering to Gentiles. And so because of that, there was this mingling going on where the apostles primarily had a Jewish knowledge. But with Paul coming in, that Gentile knowledge was new to them. And that's why you're going to notice some of their writings can have Christian doctrine that you Gentiles can apply. Why is that? Because Paul came late in the game. Another thing to understand is this. Another thing to understand, Paul, he said that was a mystery given to him. Yeah. The apostles, they were trained by Jesus, whose ministry was Jews yeah. at that time. See, so that's the reason why the apostles had a different understanding at that time. A third explanation, third explanation, remember God was switching from Jew to Gentile. You'll notice this dotted line here, right? So when you look at this dotted line, Matthew through John, Hebrews to Revelation is in this dotted line here because this was the apostles' time period they were writing. Let's be honest, when you start from the beginning of Matthew all the way to John, and then you study Acts, and then you look at Hebrews to Revelation, wasn't Jesus Christ gradually transitioning from Jew to Gentile? There's no doubt about that, right? He first said, let's start with Jews, but then he said, because you Jews will not hear, we're going to turn to Gentiles. But they didn't put like a clear-cut time period, right? You notice it was gradually fading away from Jews, and gradually turning to Gentiles. That's why you'll notice in these books, there's a mingling of Christian doctrine that's for Gentiles, as well as doctrines for Jews. That's a historical and a biblical common sense understanding. Amen. God was transitioning from Jew to Gentile. Some people might say, well, Gentiles partook in signs and wonders. It was called Acts of who? Apostle. Apostle. Paul is in a Apostle. And guess what? He started out with Jews too. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. But then he was switching to Gentile. That's what Paul said. That's why Gentiles participate in signs. Why? Because of the Jews. God was still dealing with Jews, but he was transitioning. Yeah. If you don't think so, if you think signs and wonders are still available, why didn't you cure COVID? There's no doubt it, it ended. Well, what time period it ended? We don't know. We do know this, though. It's done now because we can't put a clear-cut time period because it was gradually fading away. See that? That's why we can't put a clear-cut time period for Matthew to John, Hebrews to Revelation. Here's the clear-cut time period. Jews here, cut, Gentile, we switch. You can't do that. Why? Because God is gradually transitioning. Why would God do that? just like how he gradually does it with you. Yeah, there it is. If, there's, if you're not living your Christian life right and God gave you a calling to do and you're like, no, Lord, and you keep running away from the calling, you ever notice God gradually fading away from you and using another person to do the calling that you rejected? And he said, I'm going to use you instead because this person rejected me. But he's so merciful, he didn't end it yet. He's gradually shifting from person one who's forsaking the Lord, and gradually turning to person two, who's being used of the Lord. Did you notice when you're used by God or called by God, it's not like all at once and you start. It's gradually building up where God confirms your calling, what he called you to do. That's your God. Amen. Why would God do that? Because if he gave it all to you at once and cut you all off all at once, you die. <laughs> Remember, he is I am that I am. That's why you have to do that rightly dividing. If you go by God's timeline and everything, you 
the universe would fall apart. You, that's why rightly dividing is so important. All of this ties together with God's attribute, who he is. Dispensationalism. It's incredibly eye-opening. Incredibly eye-opening. So understanding all these, we go back. All right, so when you read a text, what do you got to do? Who is he speaking to? Jews? Gentiles. We establish that. All these books of the Bible, Old Testament books, Matthew through John, Hebrews to Revelation, we can see right here that there's going to, uh, it's going to address a lot to Jews. What time period? Why Old Testament time period for the Old Testament books? These books that the apostles wrote are the time period of Acts of the Apostles. What about Christian doctrine? Where are we based upon? It's to Gentiles, right? Romans to Philemon. Okay, but then we'll, uh, that's why we have to only stick to Romans to Philemon, says the hyper, right? And then the rest of the books we reject. No, we've seen in this case, there are some t they reject this, okay? They divide off books. You notice that, these guys? They divide books. They're amateur dispensationalists, these hypers. They're not really hyper dispensationalists. They're amateur. They divide off books and they, to make it easier because they're lazy to divide. No, we divide it all over where we believe that one verse can split in half. So that's why we believe in double application. If you don't believe in that, you don't know Bible, my friend. We've given you demonstrations of verses that can have a double application. One can jump to one time period. Another can jump to another time period. One can jump to a different person, group of people. The other half of the verse can jump to another person, different group of people. Okay, so then then how do I know which verse applies to me? Simple. You apply it unless it contradicts you. It's that simple. Uh, when you read the Bible, apply it to yourself. But then if it contradicts you, your doctrine, that's when you don't apply it. It's that simple. You might say, how do I know, uh, how do I know that? Simple. Where is your Christian doctrine? What do you know where your Christian doctrine is? Right here. That's your Christian doctrine. Okay, if you were to read John 3.3, 3, ye must be born again, that don't contradict Paul. Paul said that, uh, we, were, that the, uh, we were dead in sins, but then we were regenerated, we were born. How about that? So then, I can apply that verse to me. In John 3.3, 3, ye must be born again. What about, uh, what about the passage in Matthew 24? He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, I can't apply that to me. Why? Because it contradicts the Christian doctrine in Paul, where it says in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and 4.30, that even if I sin and grieve the Holy Spirit, I'm still saved. I don't have to endure or hold on to it. All right, what if I read Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He shall make me to lie down in green pastures. Doesn't contradict us in any way with God being our shepherd, taking care of us as sheep. What's wrong with that? So then, I can apply that verse to myself. Here's a simple one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. No, that don't apply to me. Come on, man, that you wouldn't even exist, all right? You were in there when Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, when God created the heaven, the earth, and everything. You had to be in there, otherwise you're not in there, all right? You're not part of the creation of man. So, unless that contradicts somewhere here, does it contradict? No. So you can apply that. Here's another one. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Does that contradict us? Yeah. Why? Because Paul said, here's one verse I forgot. All right. Colossians. All right. I forgot that. Colossians. Okay. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. In verse 16. Colossians 2, 16. So remember the Sabbath day. So you Christians have to observe the Sabbath. Does that contradict uh, Paul's writing, yes, because Paul says we're not bound to keep the Sabbath. Amen. Colossians 2 and verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of unholy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. See that? So notice that the Sabbath days are not applicable to us. Now, I have a big question for you guys. Why are you so obsessed with the book of Revelation and Genesis especially Acts in Hebrews, 
when you don't know your basic Christian doctrine, your doctrine, you want to know other people's doctrines more than yours? This is most important, Romans to Philemon. Amen. And people don't like these books because they're too easy. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Then why did you get messed up with all this kind of stuff? You don't know your basic Christian foundation. Obsessed with conspiracies, obsessed with online stuff, revelation, something deep doctrine that Pastor Kim's going to teach next. You're in the wrong place, bud. You got to be right here. Amen. Until you know this first, why do you think I can get into deep doctrine? Because I knew this first. And then when I got to that deep doctrine, I'm able to clear and filter it out and be able to apply something where... It can work for myself, but then the other areas, I know it cannot apply to me. It's a tribulation timeline, or if it's an Old Testament timeline, etc. That's how you read your Bible. It's that simple. You need to know Pauline epistles. If you know your Pauline doc, uh, Paul's, uh, what I mean by Pauline is Paul's. If you know Paul's doctrines in Romans to Philemon, then what's going to happen is this. You will know, and you don't have to be paranoid when you read the verse. Can I apply this to myself, or can I not? No. Just generally apply it to yourself. The Bible says all scripture is given, right? He gave it for you to read. But the only time that you have to realize that it doesn't apply to you is what? Is when it contradicts Paul's doctrine, Romans to Philemon. That's how you know. It's that simple. So just read your Bible like you would read every day and enjoy it and learn something from it. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. But make sure when you read that, that you don't apply a wrong doctrine in the verse to yourself, because the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, 15. This will open up everything about Bible interpretation than you ever saw before. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teachings have been incredibly eye-opening, has encouraged us with our study of the Scriptures and understanding of the Scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.